Amen. Thank you guys again. Praise the Lord. God has been so good to us. Amen. Amen. Listen again, our church's family's condolences to Tim's family and just to those who wanted to know, uh, there will be a viewing for Tom, Tim's older brother, from 5 to 8 at Earthman Rest Haven Funeral Home. That's on 45 near Greens Point there. Uh, most of you are familiar with that location that there will be the funeral services will take place here on Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. You're invited to come and attend. Those of you who'd like to help feed the family, get a hold and see Erica after the service and she'll give you some, uh, tell you where you can plug in and serve and, and help in that regard. Amen? Amen? Listen, I'm starting a new series called Battle Ready Today, The Invisible War. And uh, this might be a little heavy for some folks, hopefully not too much, maybe just enough to shock you into realizing that there's more going on in the world than what most people see. I think one day it's going to surprise us all the things that we dealt with in our life and really saw how much of those things were not just necessarily a psychological or emotional or physical or even regarding the culture that we live in, but were really spiritual things that were going on as well. So I, I want to just kind of do an introduction to this series of messages that we will be in over the next several weeks. And I cannot encourage you enough to come be a part of this particular series. I think that one day, as I said, we're going to wake up and find ourselves in a situation where we realize more than anything else going on that we're involved in a spiritual conflict of sorts. How many times in our life have we not realized that? And there's been these kind of unnatural and normal, or normal fears or uncertainties or despair or even times of depression that we've been going through. We can't kind of put a handle on what we're dealing with or, or what's going on. Times of hopelessness. I believe we don't realize just how many other issues that we deal with in our culture, such as, uh, you know, depression and addictions and so, how many other things that are strongly seem to fight against us in the world that we live in and really don't understand just how spiritual much of that is. We're going to have to realize in one day that there's more than just this physical plane, this little physical dimension that we live in. The Bible talks about the heavenlies as well, and there's a spiritual life that's all around us is abounding. God is spirit. And those who worship him, the Bible says, must worship him in spirit and in truth. So there is a spiritual world that's going on. The Bible tells us that there are angels, there are demons, there were, that one-third of the angels left heaven, and those angels are, many have been locked away already, according to what Ch Genesis teaches and the, the book of Jude says, but there are still multiplied millions, perhaps, who knows the number, countless even, of demons who still inhabit the planet and the atmosphere around us. And it might just shock us all to be able to have pull the blinders off our eyes one day and to be able to look into that spiritual realm and see all that was really happening, not only from God's holy angels sent out to protect the saints of God, but also, you know, these un unholy angels that would seek to ruin our lives. The Bible is very meticulous, tells us that Satan's very meticulous in what he does, and there are unseen forces that are all around us. You, you can't read the Bible and not see that. You can't read the Bible and not clearly understand that. You might not understand the Bible, but you do see that there is this invisible war that is waging. And so I want to talk about those things, maybe give you some insights even today as, as we deal with it. I'll be looking today, at, and we'll, over the next couple of weeks, we'll focus in on Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, the book of Ephesians, and especially chapter 6. In chapter 6, he's wrapping everything up. It's the final part of the letter to the church at Ephesus, and it kind of starts where we start to, in verse 10 where he says, finally, my brethren. We'll have it on the screen. If you, if you don't look it up in your Bible, you'll see it on the overhead. Well, maybe you will, or maybe you won't. Well, I don't know. I'm supposed to get it turned on. It is now. All right. Finally, <laughs> be patient with those in the sound, but no, be patient. <laughs> be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Verse 12 says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against the powers and against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, he goes on in verse 13, that I don't have on the screen, but he wraps it up by talking about, hey, take on this full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day. And having done all to stand, he says, you can stand firm. Now, he's writing to Christians, all right? He's writing to Christians, not just then, but Christians who would read from there to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and the establishment of the kingdom on earth. He's writing this word, a, 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 a clear introduction to saying, hey, you're in a war. 
There are things going on around you that you cannot see. They're on a spiritual plane. And you need to realize that you're going to, there's, there's a spiritual war going on. And it's a, it has to be fought in a spiritual manner. I mean, you look at even the life of Jesus. You certainly see the, him modeling this for us. And Jesus steps on the scene as a full-grown man. And in the book of, Acts, or book of Luke chapter 4, and he's baptized by John, it says from there, and verse 2, it says, for 40 days he entered into a struggle with the devil that he was fasting during this time and struggling with Satan. Now, I know some people think, well, I just think there's just, wasn't it just three temptations. Well, there are three that are recorded that took place during this 40-day trial. And you have to realize Satan doesn't just come and tempt you once and you say no and that's done. Anybody figured that out? <laughs> it's a return and return and return on issues to thwart you and to hinder you and to keep you from being what God's desire and design is for your life. And so Jesus deals with this. His ministry begins like this. His ministry ends like this, his earthly ministry in Gethsemane when he's in the garden, right? And he's doing battle, I believe, with the forces of hell. He's talking to his father. He's under so much stress, so much strain, so much intense. And so this war is raging in this, so intense in this moment that he's sweating great drops of blood. You follow the, the life of the apostle Paul the book of Acts, and you see his ministry taking off, and you see Satan's attacks on him grow. Even as it was with Jesus, I, I believe we see a little simple, clear lesson here that once we enter into this new life in Christ, and we've experienced this new birth in Christ, the battle really starts waging then. Say, so he's kind of had us where he wanted us up until that point, but when we get serious about following God, then the, the, the storms begin to rage, and then the battle begins to take place. And as we go, now I was so naive in those early days to think, well, the more that I live for Jesus, that the battle is probably going to lighten up the older I get in Christ, you know. The more mature I become as a Christian. Uh, that's not true. It, Satan doesn't ever stop. He never quits, all right? We have a theme for our men's retreat this year, which can describe the devil one way, unstoppable, all right? But he is stoppable. We are unstoppable when we get it right with God and do what God wants us to do in our life. We should be unstoppable. But he, he one thing about Satan, he's consistent. All right? And he consistently has one thing in mind, and that the Bible tells us very clearly, Satan's plan for your life is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. All right? He's not your friend. He'll never be your friend. He doesn't want to be your friend. He just wants to ruin your life. And if he can't keep you from knowing God, that once you do know God, he'll try to keep you from really growing deeper with God and having a real relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's ministry kind of spoke this over and over. As he went into the ministry, he was met with lots of opposition into what he was doing. I mean, from the beginning, he, he faced opposition. He was seen in the early days of the church when he first meets the apostles and disciples of John the Baptist, and they were disciples of John looking for the coming Savior. Well, Paul tells them that Jesus has come and lived this sinless life and died on the cross for our sins and is resurrected from the dead. And they become followers no longer of John. They become followers of Jesus Christ. So they, they come to knowledge of Christ. This, he goes into the synagogues uh, all over Asia. It says he went into the, the local synagogues and into the schools of Tyrannus. And it says, this took place for two years. And Paul did this so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both the Jews and the Greeks, and that God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hand of the apostle Paul. That's in chapter Acts 19 as you follow his journeys through and see what he was doing. He led a lot of people to Christ and knowledge of Christ. They surrendered their lives to the Lord. Many of them were like the Bereans who came and heard the gospel of Jesus, who were deeply involved in witchcraft and idol worship. And upon hearing the message of Jesus as Lord and Savior, they burnt all those books on witchcraft, and they burnt all the items and uh, all the t sorcery items that they had in their homes and cleaned their lives up. In fact, it says in verse 17 of Acts 19 that upon doing that, the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. But even while all this is going on, he's facing oppositions. There were Jews who didn't want to hear the message of the Messiah return. They didn't like Jesus. They didn't want to hear the gospel. They sought to kill him. There were those who, as he did minister, would mimic him and follow him around and harass what he was doing. He was threatened when he went to different places. In the book of Ephesians, I, I believe it was Demetrius and the fellow silversmiths of the city who made their money from making idols out of silver and selling them to the people who'd been blinded by this false religion. 
They want to kill Paul because he's messing up commerce, all right? They're seeking to destroy his life. So constantly, he was facing opposition. Now, I know most preachers, if they're getting this much opposition from the people they're trying to minister to, are looking for a new place to minister and signing their letters, of, you know, looking for sending out their resume somewhere. But he, he's, he's tenacious. He sticks with it. He keeps moving forward, and he realizes that there's struggle. Today, I don't believe things are that different. We're living in a, obviously a more modern technical world, and I think Satan's not going to overplay his hand as he, that, as, as he did so much in those days, but there's still obvious demonic activity in the world that we live in. There's still people who worship Satan even. There are people who summon demons to this day, but they don't have to summon hard because they're near and they're ready, and they're more interested in destroying the life of a believer than they are just about anything else. In fact, there's a unique verse, you know, we need to look at. But in looking at any of these verses, please realize today that the life we're going to live, if we're going to live for God, if we're going to commit our life to Christ, it's going to be a life of warfare. And if we don't realize that and we don't get that mental grip on the fact that, hey, I'm facing warfare, I am facing battles, there's struggles, and they're not on the plane nor on the level or the field that I think they would be on, I need to find out what God says. There's a verse that Jesus at the beginning of his ministry in chapter in Matthew 11. He's talking about John the Baptist, and he says this, from the days of John the Baptist until the kingdom of heaven, you know, it has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. Now, theologians, they break this verse down into meaning several different things. Some like, well, you know, uh, God's will and God's kingdom has always been resisted. So, you know, this is what that's talking about, and they want to destroy it and take it by force. But there are others who look a little closer at this, this, the, the writing of this and its original form and language was in Greek. And the Greeks use a different kind of terminology than what we are translating those words into English in so many Bibles. It's really a word that has to do that if you're going to be a part of the kingdom of God, then there's going to, have to be something passionate about you. We use the word zealous. In scriptures, when it uses the word zeal, it's talking about a warlike spirit. In other words, if I'm going to follow God, I'm going to have to, I want to be aggressive in my commitment. I want to be radical in my decisions. I want to be serious about this thing called heaven and God and the cross and Jesus Christ and eternity. It's, it said there has to be a passionate zeal, almost this warlike attitude for you to move forward in the kingdom of God because you will encounter those things that are antichrist. John the apostle said there are many spirits gone out in the world and they are spirits of antichrist. In other words, they are spirits that are against God and God's people and God's church and God's will. And we need to understand that or we will certainly be defeated in our lives. It was David the psalmist who wrote this in Psalms, 1, uh, Psalms 144. He said, blessed be the Lord my strength who teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight. It was Paul who wrote the Corinthian church in chapter 10 when he said, listen, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal. In other words, they're not what we can lay physical hands on, but they're spiritual weapons, mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. If you follow these words to Timothy from the apostle Paul in, in his first letter, he told Timothy, I charge and I entrust you, Timothy, that you may wage a good warfare. He told him in chapter 6 of that first letter, fight the good fight of faith. He writes to him a second time in Timothy. In chapter 2, it says, No man that entangles himself with the affairs of this life, all right, that he may please the one who has chosen him to be a soldier. He says, you're going to have to get preoccupied not with the world and the affairs of this life, but you're going to be preoccupied with the things of God. Because, Timothy, there's a war going on. There's a, there's a, there's a battle at hand. In 2 Timothy 4, he said that Paul wraps up his ministry by making this statement. I have fought the good fight. Well, who's he fighting? Other Christians that don't agree with him? The Jews who disagreed with him? You know, the political scene, Caesar and all? No. He's fighting a completely different battle. It is a spiritual battle. It is a unique battle. It is spiritually, in, 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 in every aspect of it, it is a spiritual battle. It requires spiritual strategy. It requires, as this passage we'll see in Ephesians in the, in the coming weeks tells us, it requires requires a spiritual wardrobe, a uniform. It requires spiritual weapons. If we don't know anything about that, 
then certainly we're going to find ourselves living a life of absolute despair, disappointment, confusion. I mean, if somehow, just right there where you're sitting, you could kind of pull back time and pull it out in front of you like pulling up an old movie on your laptop, you know, and just look at the last week and the situations of last week and start really examining what was going on in hindsight because they always say it's 2020, right? My age is not quite 2020, even in hindsight. <laughs> but you start seeing things and say, oh, that probably, uh, that wasn't at all what I thought it was. Boy, I, that, I was certainly duped on that deal, or I was certainly deceived. I think a lot of times we, we sit back and look at the week and say, man, I have some regrets, or maybe I need to make some phone calls and apologize. Things like that. How, because I think most of the time we really don't see the source of what we're dealing with. He says, the weapons of our warfare aren't carnal. He said, we don't fight on the, in the realm of flesh and blood. Now, what does that mean? Well, I, let me say, put it simply put. I'm a pretty simple put, guy to start with. Your wife's not your enemy. <laughs> your husband's not your enemy. Your kids, no matter how mean they might be, they're not your enemy. That backslidden relative, he's not your enemy. That well, family member you're just ready to disown, throw in the track, they're not your enemy. But Satan wants to convince us that our battle is not spiritual in nature at all. He would love to see you struggling with each other instead of struggling with him. And all too often, I think we just don't realize what we're facing. Paul gives a brief description of it in, in this chapter in, in verses 11 and 12. And he gets to verse 12, and he's talking about our flesh. It's not a flesh and blood battle. And he starts talking about who the battle is against. He lists... He lists some, some categories here of, of demonic structure, and he breaks it down into four things. And these are, these are described like different kind of levels or rankings of demonic forces, of, of, these evil, of these evil spirits. And it's a brief description of this supernatural empire which Satan heads, and he runs. And he breaks it down like this. Let me read you the verse. He says, against, against, he says our, we're not fighting flesh and blood, but against rulers. It's also his word called principalities. And he says against the powers. And the third is against the world forces of darkness. And the next is against spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly place. The first one when he talks about rules, rulers, or principalities, it's a word which is used in the Greek language for uh, people in authority or principalities. But here's talking about the, the rule of, of demons is what Paul's talking about here. That there's a rank and an order and a rule of these fallen angels and these demons. The idea here is that these are very powerful demons, which if you follow the, this particular word throughout Scripture and how it's used, it's talking about forces that are fighting on, on the level of, of kingdoms and nations. I mean, really, honestly, why do you think there's so much division in the world and so much strife and disunity? Because according to what the Bible teaches, there are principal demons, ruler demons, who are under the tutelage and the leadership of Satan himself seeking to bring strife and hatred and war and murder into the hearts of the leaders of nations. That's why the Bible over and over again tells us to pray for our leaders and all who are in authority. Why do we need to pray for them? Because they're on a spiritual battleground and unfortunately most of them have no idea they are. Can I get an amen? I don't care what your political grouping is. <laughs> It doesn't take much listening to politicians to see this is true. There's got to be something behind the scene. The forces behind the forces, so to say. And that's, he said, that's another category. And then he talks about not only principalities or rulers, he said there's this another category here, which he refers to as powers. That's the word used often in the New Testament, which is the word exousia, which is a word which really means they're, they're authoritarian, they're authorities. And these are, if you follow again, this particular word in Scripture and this description, this describes those demons that were leading powerful demons among created beings, some of the most, more powerful, superior obviously to man, and spiritually powerful demons. And he's telling me, I've got these guys to fight. You've got to stand against these forces when they come against you. How in the world do we do that? And then he talks about another one. I mean, that isn't enough. He says there's the world forces of this darkness. And the idea is here, these were demons in charge of the, of the world of, of worldly affairs and worldly businesses and that they dwell and, and, and hide in the shadows and their areas were not revealed and they're of this world. And by the way, if you understand what happened when man fell 
because of sin. When Adam and Eve chose against God and sin came upon all of the creation, we all became sinners at birth because of that sin. It was at that point also that Satan became the leader. The Bible refers to him as the God of this world. That's a little g, by the way, all right, because God's bigger and greater and stronger than the devil, if you had any questions about it. But these are these demons. They're walking in their rightful domain until the time comes when Jesus takes all rule and authority under his feet. The fourth category here that's described by Paul, there are these spiritual forces of wickedness in celestial or heavenly places. And the idea is these demons are focused mostly on spiritual things, things like cult religions and false religions. Have you ever wondered, you know, even as a Christian, there's so many cults that kind of shoot off Christianity and things that you look at, things like Mormonism and Jehovah Witness and these cultish things. How do you know they're cults? Because they deny the, 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 the lordship of Jesus Christ. They'll tell you that he's a brother of the devil or he, he's just a son of God. In fact, in their Bibles, they rewrite the writings to present Jesus as just a son of God instead of the only begotten one of the Father. You say, is that important? That's extremely important, all right? We're not going to become another God, all right? We are the children of God. We become his children by grace and by rebirth. But there, you ever wonder, say, how can so many millions of people be blinded by some of these cult Christian religions or even the religions of the world, which are so obviously contrary to the very nature of God when you study Scripture? Because there are forces behind those teachings. There are powers behind those things, influences behind those things that are working to defeat and to blind man and his understanding. In fact, this may shock you just a bit, but before you come to know Christ, the Bible makes it clear that if we're not in Christ, if we haven't given our hearts and our lives to Jesus Christ, the Bible says that the, that the God of this world, that's that liturgy again, has blinded the mind of unbelievers lest they should see the light of the glorious gospel in the face of Christ Jesus. What does that mean? Well, let me just take from my situation. I can speak personally, all right? Before I came to know Christ, I wasn't interested. I only was interested in me. Oh, I believe there was a God. And I, you know, I kind of agree there's a Jesus out there, and he probably died. And, uh, but that really gave me no, you know, I really wasn't jumping on board or anything. I was just interested in living my own life, doing what I wanted to do, ruling my own world. In fact, there may be a God, but I'll let him do his thing as long as he lets me do my thing. That was kind of the general consensus of my relationship with God. I didn't realize that I was fallen in sin. My understanding didn't get it. I didn't realize that I was separated from God, a God who loved me, a God who had purpose, significance for my life, who had, who had meaning for my life. I didn't realize this. I was blinded in my mind. My understanding was blinded. But as people began to pray for me, people began to share with me, tell me about Christ, the blinders began to be lifted off, and I saw the light of the glorious gospel. Listen, there was nothing glorious about the gospel before I named no Christ. I had people talk to me about Jesus. I'd just laugh at them and tell Jesus jokes. You know, nothing glorious about the gospel. But when I got my eyes open and gave my heart to Christ, I, I began to see the light of the glory. I began to see just how wonderful it is to know Jesus, how, how life really falls in place when you give your heart to Christ. It all came together. But until then, we get, we're subject to these lying spirits, these deceiving influences and these deceiving spiritual forces. And understand, according to verse 12 of that passage, they are supernatural forces. Now, I really believe that a lot of people don't come to Christ because they're in blinded bondage, just like the Bible says. And it's only the gospel and the truth. When we share truth with them, their eyes begin to get open. If we pray for them, their eyes begin to get open. They still have to make a choice. Everybody does. You, nobody can make a decision for Christ for you. But until then, we, we lie in bondage. But how many Christians, even on the other hand, are still in captivity? Captivity to bitterness and captivity to hatred and captivity to addictions and all kinds of things in their life that are just out of whack and out of place. Problems in their life and problems in their homes and problems where they live and where they work. And they don't know how to deal with those problems except on a flesh and blood plane. Well, I can, maybe I can reason with this person. Well, they're just unreasonable now. Maybe I can convince them. And you don't realize that there are forces behind the scene that are also at work and also seeking to bring division and strife and hatred and bitterness. We think our battle is sometimes just within, you know, a relationship or a situation or, or with a boss. 
And we just don't understand many times what's really going on. We get mad at the wrong people. You ought to be getting mad at the devil. All right? It's much more fun to kiss your wife than hate her. What? Some of you ought to try it. <laughs> it can't advance from kissing even, all right? So we're in the stage where people just aren't con really convinced there's even a war going on. How are they ever going to win a war? They're not convinced of the reality. They say, Brother Joe, you're scaring me out of this devil stuff. I remember <clears throat> one of my early mentors in ministry was a guy who dealt a lot with spiritual warfare. One of my fathers in the faith, in the early days of the church, he's since gone to be with Jesus, but we had him preach several times. And he always used to come and preach just about prayer and spiritual warfare, Dr. Mickey Bonner. I had lunch with Mickey one day. I said, Mickey, do you just see a demon behind every tree? He said, well, I've been accused of that. He said, but no, I don't believe that. Just every other tree. <laughs> but we're not afraid of these things. Because if you study the Bible and you read the Bible, God is telling us, there's these incredible, powerful beings out there, but not to worry. Jesus is greater. And if you trust Jesus and you're living in Jesus and you're living for Jesus, you got this deal one. You have what you need. That's why Paul's telling them, hey, you know, he just presents this incredible big enemy to them. I mean, ruling spirits, powerful spiritual beings, ruling on the planet, manipulating governments and kingdoms and economies, you know, all this uh, manipulating people and families. And we're thinking, how are we going to deal with this? And he said, hey, in Christ, you stand strong in the power of the Lord. You've got to realize that, there's a, that there is a war going on there. You can't sit back and laugh about it. You can't think, well, my, my battle is really just with my budget. <laughs> my, my, the finances were different. Everything would be just wonderful. No, it wouldn't. You know, you, and you come with all these snares. This would not make with life great. Hey, God, hey, you're on the planet still, all right? And the Bible says that this world is contaminated by sin, all right? And the Bible tells us that there's, there's, a, there's issues in this world. And you're going to have a battle. You're going to have to battle with, your, with the world culture that resists God because that's becoming more prominent every day. But the resistance towards the gospel of Jesus Christ and the, and the word of God, that, that battle's becoming. We don't want God in school. We don't want God in the courts. We don't want God anywhere anymore, right? So we see that just from the world itself. What's motivating that? Well, I think you know now. And then we have a battle with our own flesh. I mean, so the, the apostle said, you know, the things I want to do, I don't do. All right? <laughs> and he said, well, I find myself at times doing the things I don't want to do. Amen. So what does all that mean? That means, hey, there's still a struggle that goes on just with yourself. Yes. You know, just yourself. That, the desire to, you know, to make yourself number one. Nobody's going to tell you how to act, what to say, what to do. What, you, you, you know, you're your own man. You're, bless God, you're going to do whatever you want to do. There's that battle with our pride. There's that battle with our own emotions. There's that battle and struggle with our own anger. All those things are still a battle. But you add to that this third element, there is a, there's a spiritual battle. Well beyond psychological, emotional, you know, and all those things, we're, we're fighting on the spiritual front. How in the world are we going to do that? Well, that's where he's going with his letters. He's wrapping everything up. But you have to understand, when you read this letter, and I encourage you to do so this week, start with chapter 1, because before he ever says, finally, my brethren, he starts with five other chapters that talk about the rest of your life, and the first three chapters uniquely talk about Understand, this is the Joe Arms translation, all right? Jesus is saying, I whip the devil. And because I whip the devil, you can whip the devil. But you're going to have to do it in my strength. All right? And Paul starts his letter. I'm going to read you the verse in just a minute. In, in chapter 1, he says, I'm just praying your eyes will be open. Because what's that blindness is there? I'm praying that you would get your eyes open to see. And that ought to be our prayer every day that, Lord, let me see this day as it really is, not the way I just see it on a physical plane. Let me, let me see my wife and my children or my husband or my boss or the school I attend or, or the world. Let me start seeing things from a different perspective. This is called in the Bible discernment. God, give me discernment. I, I don't want to be duped. I don't want to be fooled. I, I don't want to be barking up the wrong tree, so to say. You know, I just need to get to knowing what's really going on. So you have to wake up as you start looking at Scripture and these things and wake up to the fact that there is a spiritual battle going on. 
It is a spiritual war. And the weapons are spiritual. And this wardrobe he tells us to put on is spiritual. He talks about physical, but he's using it as a symbolism and as an illustration of what it means to be prepared for spiritual battle. And he talks about this word wiles, it says in the King James. We're, we're not, we've got to be able to stand against the wiles. In, in the New American Standard, it says we're not standing against the wiles. He says we're standing against the methods of Satan. In other words, he's, he's giving a little insight to your enemy. He's saying your enemy is methodical. I, I didn't say the devil's a Methodist, in case you're here as a Methodist today. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> but he is methodical. And he's very, he's very, you know, unique and specific about the way he does it. In fact, this word wiles, it, it means to, it's a way of doing something deceptive, especially in a very systematic way, usually doing something in steps. So when the Bible says you need to be aware of the methods are the wiles of the devil. He said, hey, Satan's got a plan, a systematic approach to wrecking your life. All right? The devil has a very systematic way of ruining your marriage, a very systematic way of messing up your children. He's going to do whatever he can do. In fact, as I've said, he's got a method to his madness. This term in the, in the original language of the Greek, it was used also to describe wild animals and, and how they would cunningly stalk their prey unexpectedly until they, as they, like a lion tracking, you know, then pounce upon the prey that they were going to destroy. That's the way he described Satan and his attack against us. He has schemes, and there are schemes that are, that are, that are built around stealth and schemes that are based around deception. You say, well, then how in the world am I going to deal with it? This is where the grace of God comes. This is where the wisdom of God comes. This is where we learn from the Word of God how we're going to deal with it. We have to be, as we said, the sermon title is, we're going to have to be battle ready. Because if we're not battle ready, it will, excuse me, all right? Did you just do something? See what I'm talking about? <laughs> if we're not battle ready, then we're not going to, we're going to misunderstand. We're going to misdiagnose. We're going to uh, read the situation completely incorrect. We're going to see something going on in front of us. We're going to react in a certain way because we really didn't see what was happening. It could well be that someone said that stupid thing to you because God was trying to show you something behind that stupid thing and what was driving them to say that stupid thing. Are you all with me still? It's just it's almost done, all right? How difficult our life is if we really don't understand this. How difficult it is to live our life if we're not really engaged in the battle where the battle is. It's one thing to say there's a spiritual battle going on. It, it, it's like saying... Hey, guys, there's a war in Afghanistan. It's all head for Chicago right now. Well, that might not be a good description. There's a war going on there, too. So, <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying? We've got to know where it is. And then we've got to know who the enemy is. And then we've got to know how we're going to fight him. We've got to know what weapons that are available to us. How much of the irritations of our life, the dissatisfactions, the frustrations, the discouragement, those times that we're sensing fear or helplessness or hopelessness, how much of that is subjected to us on a spiritual level? We're not reading it at all. And we run to the doctor, I'm feeling hopeless and hopeless. Well, take this pill. And I take the pill and I just, now I'm just helpless and hopeless and stupid. Now, I'm not saying that there are, time, there are psychological things, all right? But many times, it's not a psychological deal. Many times, it's truly a spiritual deal. How am I going to know? This is where you need to be in the Word. How, why is it I'm always asking you to read your Bible, spend time with God daily in prayer, because that's where God's going to speak to you. That's where God's going to reveal Himself to you. There is a war going on. What have we learned? We've learned there's a war going on, but we've also learned that this war is spiritual, and it has to be waged by spiritual means. What does that mean to me? Well, he puts it here. You need to be strong in the Lord in the power of his might. Verse 10, be strong in the Lord. He closed it in that next verse, be strong in the Lord. Now, what does that mean? It means your strength comes from a different source than you. Are you with me on that? I, in other words, you don't, have to, you don't have what it takes to fight this battle by yourself. You need God. And it's an external source. But here's the beautiful part about this external source of power. It becomes internal when you trust Christ. So what you have is near and dear, all right? And what you have is what you need when you need it, where you need it, wherever that might be. In, verse, in chapter 3, he uses the same terminology in verse 16. He says that you might be strengthened with power through his Holy Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit of God is present in your life to strengthen your life, to meet the demands that are on your life. 
So the strength and the grace and the power of God is in our life through Jesus Christ. We've been brought into union with Christ, so we have what we need. But we also have learned, not only is this spiritual battle, we have the strength that we need from the Lord, but we also realize we have an obligation here to stand and resist, and the way we do that is to be in the armor of God. And verse 11 and verse 13, he tells you, put on the whole armor of God. Verse 13, put on the whole armor of God. And he says it twice. Is that because he forgot what he just wrote? No. There's a point being made anytime you see this repetition. It's like when the Bible says, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. You didn't hear it the first time? You got it the second time. Put on the full armor of God. Take on the full armor of God. In other words, armor is required. And this is done in a daily moment of just realizing God's presence in your life. And as we'll talk about in the weeks to come, I, I believe it's going to be a revolutionary change for some of your lives. But what you've got to be sure, folks, right here and right now, is you're not afraid to make a decision to put on the full armor of God. And you're not afraid to enter into this arena because Jesus Christ has won this battle. Now, I don't have it on the screen, but I want to read this last couple of verses to you before we're dismissed. It's in Ephesians chapter 1, and I would encourage you to do this. And in fact, it starts with verse 18. I'd not only encourage you to read it, I'd encourage you to pray it. Because this is the apostle Paul, and he's telling them, here's my prayer for the church. So this is what he was praying for the Ephesian church. And this is what your pastors pray for you, the leaders of your church. We all pray this. I pray, verse 18, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. No more darkness there. Enlightened so that you will, catch this, so you will know what is the hope of his calling, so you will know what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and you will know what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. He said, what's that? I'm praying your eyes get open so you see all the power you have in Christ. Now, he tells them this before he gets to the demon stuff, all right? <laughs> He's trying to remind them, you have what you need, that you'll see and you'll know that your eyes will be open to see this great power that you have in Jesus Christ and who is strengthening you. He's with all his might. And he brought that about, it says in verse 20, he brought it about in Jesus Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places. And he put Jesus far above all rule. These are these same words again. Authorities, principalities, powers, dominions, and every name this name, not only this age, but also in the age to come. And he's put all things in subjection to Jesus' feet and gave him, Jesus, to be the head over all things, even the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. What's he telling you there? Get your eyes open. I'm praying your eyes will be open. I think we ought to start our week that way. I think we ought to start our days that way. Lord, today, I pray my eyes will be open. See, all you have before me, all you want to do with me, all you want to do in me, all you want to do through me. Amen? So we're in a war. We realize our strength is from the Lord, and we realize we need armor, spiritual armor. So I pray you take it up this week. You say, I don't fully understand it. Start praying. God will show it to you. But even just as good, come back next Sunday. We'll talk about it some more. Let's stand with our heads bowed.